tell those of you who were la here last week, there's no way I could top what we did last week. So just, I beg your forgiveness. And um, if you haven't uh, heard, last week was Holy Humor Sunday. Uh, it is on YouTube. We have a Franklin Circle Church uh, channel on YouTube. Please check it out. But do pray with me as we begin this time of meditation. Oh God, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable to you, O God, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. The legend goes, as recorded in the 100th anniversary booklet of this congregation in 1942, that James H. Garfield, while president of the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute, we now know it as Hiram College, got himself caught up in his own arrogance <laughs> and was in hot water at our church. The story indicates that Garfield, at that point a regular preacher for Franklin Circle Church of Christ in the late 1850s, had the audacity, the audacity, to approach the Board of Elders and request a raise. How dare he? <laughs> he was doing the work of the Lord, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he dared ask for a raise. Anyone want to guess how much that raise was? Ten dollars. A year. The story goes poorly, as you might imagine. Mr. Garfield, future Civil War hero, future president of the United States of America, was summarily fired as preacher at this church. You can almost hear the elders clucking in disgust. That's what we get for employing the services of a hireling. We don't use that word a whole lot anymore, do we? A hireling. Well, I looked up in Collins Dictionary what a hireling word was. Most often it is a derogatory word for a person who works only for the money, especially someone who is paid to do something unpleasant. Now we're gonna leave the second half of that definition for another sermon at another time. But we're going to look at the first part of that. A hireling is someone who works only for the money. It is sufficient to say that the elders of this congregation, while it sounds out of keeping in our day, and in fact they did give me a raise without firing me, I will tell you that, the elders were very much in accordance with a mindset, perhaps of a uh, most of North America at that time, but certainly with our tradition that is now known as the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Did a little research in, in the iconoclastic journal of the 1800s, the Christian Baptist. Alexander Campbell, one of our founders, attacked all human institutions. He was pretty over the top about a whole lot of things, but he had a special indignation for the hireling clergy who he felt were promoters of corrupt institutions. <laughs> Campbell not only wrote about these hireling preachers, or, or as was called, located preachers, how dare a preacher go against the, the Bible and locate himself, in that time it was just hymns, in one congregation and expect to stay there. That's not what the gospel preached. He would say. But he preached in one sermon on Isaiah and rails when the ecclesiastical hireling lifts up his voice in the sanctuary saying, What will you give me when many shepherds have fleeced their flock and then scattered them on the hillsides? Even in this portentous day, we are warranted to expect that the Lord will soon revive his work and we are encouraged by the kind of prophecy of God to hope that the day is not far hence when the stumbling block shall be removed out of the way of the people. 
and those itinerant pastors, those who come up from the midst of the congregation, the true pastors, will be able to do their work. Campbell seemed almost titillated by talking about these hireling clergy. He, he pulled them all together and called them hirelings, drones, idle shepherds, dumb dogs, blind guides, and unfaithful watchmen. I've had nicer things said about me in the past. <laughs> Makes one quake in their shoes. Dumb dog and blind guide. Ooh. Of course, I want to point out that this is the very same Alexander Campbell who would later go on to found Bethany College, which became a central educational institution for the training of these very hireling clergy, even up into our day. As a matter of fact, there are some sitting in our pews who are hireling clergy that were trained at this very Bethany College. But retired. <laughs> Notwithstanding, Campbell and the other early reformers, I believe, were truly trying to figure out what Jesus meant in this very passage. Jesus very clearly distinguishes between the shepherd that is good, the one that lays down his life for his sheep, and the hired hand who, when he sees the wolf coming, runs away. Now, Jesus doesn't use the words that Alexander Campbell does, the fleecing of their flock, but Jesus is giving us a pretty, indicate, pretty good indication of which one to trust. What's the difference between a hired hand and a shepherd? Between a mercenary and a missionary? So I think the question behind the question is, who should we trust? Who should you trust in this world? There are lots of people and lots of institutions vying for your trust. Who do you trust? But more importantly, why do you trust those people and institutions? What is it about them that you, that, that you are willing to give yourself to them? Whether it's through your donations, through your time and energy, through your love. You send your family members to some of these institutions that you trust. You sleep in some of them. You work in some of them. You play in some of them. Why do you trust them? Jesus and Alexander Campbell, by extension, helps us think about this and ask the question, does paying someone to do something automatically ensure or engender trust? You know what I'm saying? Just by paying someone to do something, does that mean you should trust that person? Well, of course, the answer is a resounding no. At risk of undermining my own precious employment, not to mention a sacred profession that I am a part of, I would agree, just by paying someone doesn't mean you should trust them. Trust has to be earned. Trust has to be proven in other ways. But as Campbell would later most clearly show in his educational commitments, Bethany College being one of them, but there were others, there's a consistency and depth of theological training that would allow for, and indeed be a very good way to figure out how to trust a pastor. While I believe profoundly in what we've been talking about today, the priesthood of all believers, I also know that the time that I have set aside for my educational training, which opened up literally a millennia of wisdom and knowledge to me, a training that gave me very specific skills and techniques that would last through my entire career, that the carefully supervised field education work that I went through, and the 26 years of experience through my student and full-time pastor has provided me the chance to do what I'm doing right now, and that is help train a host of other priests. I believe that my training 
doesn't make me necessarily a hireling, but if done right, empowers me to then go out and help each one of us fulfill our calling as the priesthood of all believers. And as our children's minute today said, then you are called to go and do that very thing for others. I would never even begin to imagine training in my education and my experience just so I wouldn't be called a hireling. And I hope you would. But the question of whether or not we can trust someone more if we pay them to do it isn't just related to clergy. There are great movements in our society this very day in our political and social structures that put a premium on hiring people to do the work. We call it privatization. Privatization is where a public sector business, enterprise, agency, service, property, is transferred to a public sector, I mean a private sector. Public has moved to a private. The most hotly contested one in our state right now, and I'm sure you've heard about this, is whether or not we sell the right to run our toll roads to a private company. It's a legitimate question. Can a private company do a better job of running our toll roads than our government? It's a fair discussion, but the question we are asked today is, do we just trust those entities, those private entities, because we're paying them to do it? Does the free market system really simply just ensure that it's going to be trustworthy? <laughs> so, for Jesus, he didn't have to worry about toll roads. He didn't have to worry about the conversation about privatizing the postal service or military contractors or prisons. For Jesus, this whole issue comes down to whether or not you can trust someone on a personal level. And for Jesus, his factors in how and why we should trust someone are very, very clear. It's about relationship. It's about sacrifice. It's about servanthood. But most importantly, it's about love. It's the one that you are giving your trust to able to offer those kinds of things. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I have to say, as one of Jesus' sub-shepherds, this is a very tall task. I care about you all, but am I willing to lay down my life for you? I ask that question. That may not have been implied, but I can assure you that the search committee that called me 11 years ago made no mention that I might have to lay down my life for you. But if I'm following the Good Shepherd, that question becomes very real. So as I pondered this question in whom we place our trust, and the question why we trust people in institutions, up on my Facebook page yesterday comes a link to a blog post from my friend, the Reverend Deborah Bolin. This post writer, Ronnie McBrayer, is pondering folks who aren't here now. Folks who are good Christians, who are living their good Christian life out in the world. For some reason or another, they've left the institutional church. They may never have been connected to it. But he's talking about those folks really who have left. He challenges those of us who are regular church folks, especially those of us who are paid to be in church each Sunday, to acknowledge that some of those folks out there who never darken our doorways actually have an authentic faith. That they are, are capable of developing, and in his words, quote, a happier, more hopeful perspective than many of us who fill the pews on Sunday. For McBrayer, those other sheep are not necessarily living beyond these church walls because they've been hurt or because they've become disgruntled. Certainly not because they've lost their faith. Some folks out there simply have found church in their experience to be unhelpful to their spiritual being, spiritual well-being. So one might say that there are folks in this world who have decided that not only do they not trust hireling clergy, 
They don't trust hireling churches. What does it mean for those of us who are here today, who do still find this institution fraught with all its inconsistencies, with all its idiosyncrasies, with its ideological altercations, a meaningful place to worship God and serve God's people? What does it mean for folks who are out there living their faith very, very well, the other sheep, I think, in Jesus' terms? What does it mean to those of us who come together? Well, first off, we have to admit, it ought to bring a little bit of humility to what we do, that we aren't the only game in town. We aren't the only place people find grace and truth and love and beauty and meaning. Practically speaking, it also means that we ought to be outside these walls as much as we are inside these walls. We should be doing God's work out in the community as much as we do it here in. But there's three things I think that particularly this challenge of the other sheep calls us to. Clearly, if we take the words of Jesus to heart, I know my own and my own know me. We should be trusting those people and those places who take the time and energy and wisdom to know us. To really deeply know us. And to trust those people who invite us to really know Jesus. Not a superficial Jesus. Not a, a syrupy sweet Jesus. But to really know the man of Nazareth that walked those dusty streets. Clearly, if we take the words of Jesus to heart, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. If we truly take those words of Jesus to heart, we should be trusting those people in those places who honor the outsider, who don't set themselves up on a pedestal as the one true church or the one true anything, and whose energies serve and honor those different from oneself. If we take Jesus seriously, we're going to look for that lost sheep and nurture that sheep wherever it may be. And finally, if we take the words of Jesus to heart, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We should be trusting those people and those places where sacrifice, selflessness, vulnerability, and love are paramount to all other qualities, including the quality of self-preservation. Jesus calls us shepherds to know and be known, to shepherd the sheep that will never be part of this fold, and to be prepared to be vulnerable and lay down our very selves for them. I happen to find these things here at Franklin Circle Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. It's why I've been here as long as I have. I happen to get to be your hireling clergy. Thank you very much. The paycheck pays a lot of good things in my life. But I'm honored and privileged to do that. Together, we may continue, we must continue to ask the question, who do we trust? Why do we trust them? And may our first answer always be, yes, we trust Jesus, the good shepherd. May it be so. Amen.